Welcome back to the Beyond Homo Sapien podcast. This show is all about human evolution and the future of the species. My name is Paul Tokizolu. Welcome back to the show. Thanks for joining us. Hey, check it out. Welcome to season four. someone doesn't need to hear this information that's okay it's not for everyone welcome to the show yo what's up everyone thanks for listening hey season three was great i know it was extensive and uh it's over so welcome to season four the quaternary so we're going to start off with a reading from emerson this is from self-reliance which you should read There is a time in every man's education when he arrives at the conviction that envy is ignorance, that imitation is suicide, that he must take himself for better, for worse, as his portion. And though the wide universe is full of good, no kernel of nourishing corn can come to him but through his toil bestowed on that plot of ground which is given to him to till. The power which resides in him is new in nature, and none but he knows what that is which he can do nor does he know until he has tried. Not for nothing one face, one character, one fact makes much impression on him and another none. This sculpture in the memory is not without pre-established harmony. The eye was placed where one ray should fall, that it might testify of that particular ray. We but half express ourselves and are ashamed of that divine idea which each of us represents. It may be safely trusted as proportionate and of good issues, so it be faithfully imparted. But God will not have his work made manifest by cowards. A man is relieved and gay when he has put his heart into his work and done his best. But what he has said or done otherwise shall give him no peace. It is a deliverance which does not deliver. In the attempt his genius deserts him, no muse befriends. No invention, no hope. Trust thyself. Every heart vibrates to that iron string. Accept the place the divine providence has found for you, the society of your contemporaries, the connection of events. Great men have always done so and confided themselves childlike to the genius of their age, betraying their perception that the absolutely trustworthy was seated at their heart, working through their hands, predominating in all their being. And we are now men and must accept in the highest mind the same transcendent destiny, and not minors and invalids in a protected corner, not cowards fleeing before a revolution, but guides, redeemers, and benefactors, obeying the almighty effort and advancing on chaos in the dark. Yo, as you can see, the Beyond Homo Sapien podcast has gotten a bit of a makeover. Hey, I'm not doing any more interviews for the foreseeable future. And in fact, I've started most of the interviews on this podcast. I probably disagree with half the shit they said. And uh, honestly, I've learned a lot in the last couple of months, in the last year. And I'm going to start sharing that. But it's not going to look the way that it always has, my friends. And here's the thing. If you're paying attention, you're going to learn a lot. If you're not paying attention, you ain't going to learn shit. That's how it's going to work. So, hey, do your homework, keep reading, keep following all the synchronicities and signs, and I'll catch you on the next episode. Stay tuned for Season 4, Episode 1. Much love, my friends. Keep doing your thing. Keep being yourselves. 
And uh, read some more books. Get the fuck off of social media if you haven't already. Like, in case you didn't get that download, get the fuck off of social media like yesteryear. (laughs) So, hey, stop being on social media. Go outside more. Read some more books. And uh, talk to you on the next episode. Much love. What's going on, everyone? Welcome back to another episode of the show. Sorry, it has been a minute. I've been uh, quite occupied in my life. I have been starting a business with my business partner, Zach Babcock. Check out podcastpowertrain.com if you want to see more about what I've been doing with podcasting and uh, where I've been going with my career and with everything. But uh, I'm getting back to the show and uh, I've had more time open up for me recently and I've got a lot more to talk about. So I wanna get back into recording episodes regularly and just wanted to say thank you so much for subscribing to the show and I hope that you will continue to join me as we dive deeper and deeper down some very weird and interesting rabbit holes. I wanna start today's show with a reading by Manly P. Hall. Today's show is going to be about the Kabbalah and uh, it's spelled a number of different ways depending on how you uh, <laughs> how you experience it sometimes with a Q sometimes with a K uh, and so on and I've even heard it pronounced a number of different ways whether it's Kabbalah or uh, Kabbalah another way or some people say the Kabbalah so there's even different ways of pronouncing it but uh, for me it's a uh, Kabbalah with the K. So we're going to get into it. This is from page 23 of The Sacred Magic of the Kabbalah by Manly P. Hall. This book was copyrighted and written in 1929, almost 100 years ago today. He says, the Kabbalah can never be written, nor can it ever be explained to the profane, for its own depths conceal it. Unrecognized and unknown, it stands behind the veil of human ignorance. The impossibility of materially objectifying the sacred science was well understood by the ancient philosophers. This is the true reason why there are so few students of the mystic sciences. Like all great things for which a man seeks, the student of the Kabbalah must be prepared to pay the price demanded by nature for the wisdom that he receives. The unwritten law cannot be learned. It must be evolved within the spiritual body of the aspiring seeker through right thought, right emotion, and right action. When the student has actually reached the point of self-mastery, then and then only the vowels assume their correct positions. The sacred centers are opened and the master's word, the key to all creation, is found in man and the student becomes a master of the sacred name. So what is the Kabbalah? If you go online or if you consult different sources, what you'll find and what people will tell you is that it is a mystical Jewish tradition. So obviously the appropriate correct question would be, what what does that mean? What is a mystical tradition? And a mystical tradition typically means something that is a relationship between you and God. It's all about a direct relationship between you and source, you and God, whatever word you want to use. So that's what people usually refer to when they mean mystical something. So if you hear about mystical Christianity, it means, for example, uh, Christianity that emphasizes the personal relationship with God over whatever, you know, the pastor might be saying. So, for example, the Gnostics were a, well, there were Gnostic Christians. There were types of Christians when Christianity first became a thing who had this real mystical understanding of uh, what that was all about and what the relationship with God was about. And um, that wasn't exclusive to Christianity. That was also happening in Judaism. 
and it has been going on in Judaism for uh, thousands and thousands of years, back allegedly to the times of Moses and uh, beforehand, Abraham and so on. And that, in a sense, is the Kabbalah, is the mystical side of the Jewish tradition and mystical understandings of the Torah, mystical understandings of different books in Jewish thought, so on and so forth. So at the end of the day, if someone is referring to Kabbalah, they're talking uh, pretty much about the idea of you having a direct relationship with God within the context of Judaism, within the context of the Jewish tradition. So it's a tradition within Judaism that is emph emphasizes this personal relationship with God, which a lot of times maybe stands in contradiction or not, not really in contradiction, but in contrast to a more orthodox or a more literal understanding of the Torah, where basically what the Kabbalists are saying or what the Kabbalistic te texts are saying is that we all have our own experience of God, that we all have our own different uh, experiences of this reality and so on and so forth. So what you, what I haven't been able to find a whole lot about is the, what, what the Kabbalah actually is, what it actually says. And that's something that you really do have to search for in research, but also in just your own understanding in your own spiritual journey. You have to search for what is the meaning of the Kabbalah in your own life and how does it actually show up for you? what does that actually mean for your life? And I, I often felt that it's ironic or in, in a sense, it's kind of funny that there's even different ways of spelling it, that it's sometimes spelled with a Q, sometimes with a K, so on. And there's different ways of pronouncing it. Like I was saying earlier, you know, whether it's the Kabbalah or Kabbalah or what, whatever. And, uh, that's really it for me in a lot of senses is this idea that we all have our own experiences and that we have these different experiences of God and a lot of that is entombed in this concept of the Kabbalah and this concept that we all have our own individual experiences of God. And in a sense, God is everywhere. God is all around you. God is speaking to you all the time. And that is what I found that the Kabbalah is truly about and what the Kabbalistic teachings, in a sense, are getting at is this idea that we are all one. We are all one consciousness. We are all one collective being and that really we are all God experiencing itself. And really this is the oldest teaching of all time. And this teaching, this idea that we are all one being, that we are all one source, that we have God inside of us, this divine spark that is inside of you and inside of me. Um, this idea that we can see God inside of ourselves, that we can see God in other people and that at the end of the day, we are all this one being that is everywhere, you know, and that the concept you might have heard of the tree of life, which is probably the most popular or the most well-known idea from the Kabbalah and the tree of life. It's this idea that there's different forms that God exists in. There's these different, they call them Sephiroth and there, and that again is also spelled different ways, depending on who you're studying or what books you're reading and stuff like that. But the tree of life is really this idea that there's different forms of God. There's different aspects of God that exist in the universe, in reality, in nature, in the energy around you and the energy all around me. And that we all have these different ways that God shows up in our lives. So the idea of the tree of life and the idea that there's these different uh, forms of God is really inherent in what the Kabbalah is and understanding that different Sephiroth correspond to different things. So for example, the number one corresponds to Kether, which is the also corresponds to the crown chakra. Uh, Kether is the crown. It corresponds to this idea of God as a enlightened being kind of experiencing itself. And honestly, for me, it means uh, unity. The one stands in my, in my uh, experience for unity, this idea of the one, the one that is at the source of everything. So you can just go on this long rabbit hole of things that one corresponds with in relationship to these different Kabbalistic uh, positions of the, on the tree of life.
what I've found is one of the easiest ways to kind of begin to get into this stuff is to study the tree of life and to start to begin to memorize these different correspondences as best as you can. However, it's difficult, honestly, to memorize all of those different things. And uh, I'm still working on it, honestly. I am by no means a expert on the Kabbalah. I'm still getting into it, honestly. And what I found, the more that you get into it, uh, <clears throat> the deeper the rabbit hole goes. And that seems to be a theme on this show a lot of times with the topics that we get into, dis into discussing. I've met some people who say you shouldn't study it until after your Saturn return, which is usually from an astrological perspective, uh, sometime in your mid thirties or so. So in other words, I'm 29, I'm still just getting into this stuff, honestly. And, uh, but I've been studying it for a couple of years. And what I've found is that really at the heart and soul of what this is all saying is that we all have this our own experience of of god that at the end of the day it's all different and god shows up in these different ways inside of our lives that these different aspects of god such as glory such as victory um, such as divine will intelligence all of these different aspects of god are are all these different things in reality rather are different aspects of god that they all correspond differently. And um, a great way to think about the Kabbalah is that it's a, it's a system of assigning different numbers to different ideas. So for example, like I was saying, the one represents unity, represents oneness. The two represents duality, represents this back and forth movement of all of creation, this force from which everything is created, masculine and feminine on both sides of the tree of life that's encompassed in the two in the three is the idea of the trinity and from that is essentially the creation of the two so it's when the two come together to make one that is added together and it makes three the four that is the tetragrammaton the sacred number and the reason for that is because it's the three that were created by the two and it comes back to unity which is the four so it's the three returning back to unity, coming back to the remembrance that they are all at their core one, and then that one is added to the three to make four. And of course, if you've been studying these things for any, any amount of time, you know that the tetragrammaton is a very important word. It's an important word in magic, in the study of Judaism, in the study of the Zohar, in the study of... The Kabbalah, is, it shows up in all these different areas, this idea that there's a sacred four-letter name of God, that you can call upon God if you know his name. And that sacred name is supposed to be the impronounceable, unspeakable name of God that ironically you pronounce all the time if you're involved in these different practices that I mentioned. And... Um, yeah, it's a it's a very complicated topic, honestly. And again, it's something I'm still learning a lot about. But essentially, the tetragrammaton is that the name Yodhava. It's the uh, Yeshua, in a sense, is the is you add one more to it and you get five, and it becomes Yeshua, which is the name of Jesus. But the four letter name of God is supposed to be encompassed in the number four, represented by the tetragrammaton, which is the sacred, impronounceable name that uh, a human is supposed to be able to pronounce, to call upon the spirits, to say that it's time. So this is something you can research on your own, but uh, I'd encourage you to look into it. I'd encourage you to read Eliphaz Levy's book about it, his book, uh, The Doctrine and Ritual of High Magic, and a uh, fantastic book. And he talks about the Tetragrammaton in there in uh, great detail. So I'd encourage that you read that. But that, again, is encompassed in the four, this idea of four elements. And again, when the four uh, has something added to it, it becomes five and it kind of restarts the cycle. So that five is represented in the name Yeshua, which is when some, you know, one is added to four. And uh, it's kind of what comes out of that Yodhava, which we saw in the four. And uh, that's represented in the five, essentially. And the five is also a representation of the pentagram and this idea that spirit is over the other four elements and so on and so forth. And then you get into six, which is the idea of beauty and kind of the creation that comes out of that. And again, it just kind of adds on itself. So 
um, I'd encourage you to look into this and research it and kind of learn what this looks like for you. But honestly, it comes down to you forming, and this sounds weird, uh, comes down to you forming a personal relationship with these different numbers. That's at, at the heart and soul of what the Kabbalah is really all about. Because yes, you can get into studying it and researching the history of it, and it's all fascinating, and I'm learning a lot more about it. You can spend your whole life memorizing Kabbalistic correspondences, and I'm learning more about that. It's a deep topic. It'll take me a long time to memorize <laughs> every single one of the Kabbalistic correspondences, but I'm working on it. And I recommend you look into it as well, but I guess what I'm saying is what I found in all of this searching is that at the heart and soul of what the Kabbalah really is, is not about what's in these the books like the Zohar or the Talmud or any of these other books or uh, the Sefer Yetzirah, although the, those are certainly worth reading. It's about you having a personal relationship with God. That's what it's all about. The, the, the true Kabbalah is something that you have a direct relationship with in your life, your day-to-day -day existence, where you begin to form this uh, direct way of communicating with God, with the universe, because it is talking back to you. And because God is around you at all times, God is inside you. God is inside every single person around you. God is inside of the cars, the trees, the, the animals, the, the rocks, the minerals. Every single thing that you see around you is, is a different form of God, uh, including the door that I'm looking at or uh, the cars that are driving past me on the street outside. Everything around me is God in some form. And that really at its soul is what the Kabbalah is saying. And again, this is the oldest teaching of this, this planet. The Kabbalah is just one name of it, of what this old teaching actually is. I think that we, uh, I'm, we're still figuring out what that ancient religion actually was called, you know, but more and more people are talking about it. I've heard it called the wisdom religion, this idea of an ancient religion that was passed down to us from Atlantis or some other time before, or some crazy other existence that, you know, came in a, in a time that is no longer with us from tens of thousands of years ago, this tradition was allegedly passed down, this oral tradition of the Kabbalah, of Hermeticism, in a sense, like that these, these two, these, these, they're all saying the same thing, essentially, that we are a conscious being, we are God experiencing itself, and everyone around you is the same. Everyone else is God experiencing themselves in different ways. And the Kabbalah breaks down how these are different, differently kind of broken down in accordance with these different sephiroth, these different ways that God is showing up in the world or in your life or in my life or inside of your own body, essentially, through this system of energy chakras that you can call upon. And God is inside of you at a very deep level, at, uh, is, makes up all of your cells, makes up everything about you. And you are God, and so am I, and so is everyone around you. So I think, you know, at the end of the day, it is important that we read these different books, that we study what people say about the Kabbalah. Like, for example, me, what I'm saying right now about it. It's important to get that sort of reference material so you know what other people are experiencing. But at the end of the day, the Kabbalah is about you experiencing the world around you and having this direct relationship with God in your life every day. And um, I'll give you some tips on what that looks like for me and what I've, what I've found <laughs> and how this might work. So a really good book to read is Aleister Crowley's book on magic. It's called Magic. And uh, you can get it on Kindle, really great book. And he talks about how to get started experimenting and learning about the Kabbalah and how to get started having this direct communication with God. So it's a really effective technique and it sounds crazy at first, but I'm going to share it with you because it's really has changed my life. And again, it sounds, sounds weird at first, but let me share this with you. So anytime that you see numbers, anytime that you have, uh, anytime that you see some numbers in front of you, uh, at any point, like right now, for example, I'm looking at the clock and it's 328. So here that's three, two, eight. So that gives me three numbers, three, two, eight, that I'm just, you know, just popped up right in front of me. So what Alistair Crowley says to do, and uh, I'm saying this, I'm recommending the same, 
is uh, two things. Number one is add those three numbers together. Number two is multiply those three numbers together. So going back to 328, it just changed actually to 329. So let's use 329. So 3, 2, and 9 added together is 5 plus 9, that's 14. And then 4 and 1 added together, that's 5. So my first number is 5. And then 3, 2, 9 multiplied, so that's 6 times 9. 9 times 6 is 54, right? <laughs> I think 5 times 4 is 20, so 2. So that gives me two numbers, 5 and 2, out of that equation, 5 and 2. Now I can take the number five and I can take the number two and I can say, all right, five, what does that represent to me? Well, yesterday in a tarot card reading, uh, the number five was showing up like crazy, honestly. In a lot of the cards, if you know about the tarot, you know that the five rep is, is correlative with struggle, with overcoming adversity and kind of pushing through something that needs to be taken care of. So yesterday I did a tarot reading for myself and I drew the five of cups, which is a really unpleasant card for me, honestly. And it usually points to that there's stuff I need to take care of in my life. And honestly, uh, there is a lot of stuff I've got to clean up in my life. Like literally my house, I'm working on cleaning my house and cleaning it top to floor. Cause there's a lot of stuff I've got to get rid of and take to the dump. And I've got to uh, sell some things on eBay and like get rid of some stuff and minimalize. So that really spoke to me and just, you know, this number five right now reminded me of all of that because for me, the number five is connected with that concept right there. And I've connected the number five to an idea in my recent experience that I can then contemplate on. And then I can say, okay, you know, am I doing this? Am I really taking care of this stuff that I said I was going to do? And it kind of reminds me and I'm having this conversation with myself inside my head but right now obviously i'm recording it for you because <laughs> i'm here on this podcast so what was the other one i think it was the two so yeah i said five and two those are my two numbers the two for me is uh about the duality and about how you know good and evil can work together to create something better that at the end of the day um obviously you don't want to tolerate evil or do anything like that but more so just acknowledging that if there is struggle if there is resistance it's only working in your favor. If there is something bad that happened, it's only working in your favor to help you create good because those two energies, those two forces have to always be in balance and good always wins uh, when your intentions are in alignment, when you have the right you know, fuel, when you're doing the right thing. And uh, at the end of the day, I guess what I'm saying is I think that what I'm, what's been happening in my life, getting my shit together literally um, you know, it's all just been fuel for the fire and it's all just been obstacles for me to overcome this year. And I've learned so much from all of that. I've learned a lot from all of that struggle and I've been, you know, ready to set step into something different and, uh, been shifting that energy and stepping into learning more from joy and getting back into the flow and getting back into being creative, like doing this podcast here. So it seems like I'm on the right track. <laughs> So, uh, in other words, what I'm saying, the reason why I just did that little exercise is because that's the conversation that I'll have with myself sometimes to check in with, with God, with myself, with my own intuition. Obviously I don't speak it out loud to myself like that. I just did that because, you know, um, recording a show, but, uh, to try to help you kind of understand how this could work in your life. But that's something I do all the time. Like if I ever feel like checking in, uh, I, you can simply just look at the numbers around you and you can say, Hey God, you know, what do you have to tell me right now? Um, let me open my mind up by adding these numbers together and looking at them. So for example, clock just changed now it's three, three, three. So I'm looking at three, three, three. And for me, again, that's, uh, all the three is representative of the Trinity. And that's kind of the creation that comes out of the two, like I was saying before, and um, again, I've built up all of these different definitions. I've come to all these different ideas in my life over a long period of time of learning about the Kabbalah and studying this stuff and doing tarot readings and studying uh, numerology, like these different um, ways of building and connecting ideas to numbers. And then you can have a direct conversation with God, with, with the universe by doing this you know, exercise of adding up numbers. <laughs> And it's, it's amazing because uh, math has always been a, a struggle for me. 
And the more that I learn about Kabbalah, the more that I learn it's, it's all about math. It's all about uh, numbers. It's all about adding up numbers and multiplying numbers and dividing and doing all these different things in your head a lot of times. So you're having this kind of intimate conversation with the universe at all times. And these numbers begin to uh, represent different things. Like for me, the number seven represents victory. Uh, the, for me, the number eight represents beauty. Nine represents initiation. The 10 represents coming back to fullness, coming back into the one. And then one starts it all over again, back at, you know, the unity, back at that first thing that comes out of God and so on. And um, so in other words, what I'm saying is like, that's how I've, that's how I've kind of assigned different numbers or different ideas to different numbers in my own life. But um, again, the Kabbalah, it's about like having this, building this for yourself and it's a system where you can start to have this really personal relationship with God and you can start to converse with the universe at all times through numbers, through signs and through ideas and concepts. But at the end of the day, like I've been saying, this is just one of the ways that I've been applying this information to my own life. Um, you're, the whole point is that you're supposed to go and figure this out for yourself. And, um, and really dive into this yourself and explore what Kabbalah and what this all actually means for you. Cause the whole point is it's all about, you know, your own personal relationship with God, with the world around you. And there's a lot more to the Kabbalah than just multiplying numbers and adding numbers, but at the heart and soul, it's all about, again, you know, assigning different numbers that you encounter to different ideas and different concepts and different uh, ideas of God, different forms of God, different ways that this energy, th these concepts show up in your life and format out what that means in your life for you. So don't listen to me. Don't trust me as the final authority on this, but rather use some of these ideas and use it to kind of stew over and get after this in your own life. But again, you can use this idea of just kind of looking at numbers around you and adding them up multiplying them together and it'll it'll get you started and it'll take you a long way because honestly it's taken me a long way and you'll also find that uh your memory improves tremendously you'll find it's a really good mental exercise to kind of keep you sharp honestly just if you're going up <laughs> adding up numbers all the time and uh, again it's something just do in your head just do silently and uh just kind of think on this to yourself you know and, and just ask yourself like how do different numbers like what, what uh, ideas do I have that I would associate to different numbers and begin to do that in your life and then begin to kind of converse with the world around you through numbers and through ideas and through these different ways. And I think that you'll, you'll it's a great way to get started uh, having this intimate personal connection with God in your own life. So I think I've given you a lot to look into or think about or explore, but uh, let me know if you have any questions and, uh, and I hope you will be well on your way. The last thing I'll say about the Kabbalah is that um, it's what's called the science of the secret names, the science of the sacred names, maybe is a different way to say it, but these different kind of names of God, these different ways, these different words that uh, God goes by, so to speak. So for example, Adonai, um, Shaddai Elkai is another one. Um, Ehiye, uh, Yodhava is another one, so on and so forth. So I'd encourage you to explore that. Just, I mean, you can get on Google and look up Kabbalah, you know, different names of God. And uh, you'll find that there's some people who actually have an understanding of the Kabbalah where Kabbalists are uh, allegedly worshiping different gods. But no, it's all the way Kabbalists understand it is it's all one God with different names, different ways of calling on God, so to speak, or different ways that God refers to themselves or himself or herself in, in, the, in the Torah, basically. So these different ways that God uh, informs you that this is how you can call me, basically. And there's a lot of different ways in Hebrew. And that's where Kabbalah is, you know, built is in Hebrew, basically, because it's the, it's the Jewish version of this, this mystic tradition, essentially. But, uh, yeah, so I think I've given you a lot to stew over and to think about, but um, look into this stuff, look into the tree of life if you never have before. 
Uh, maybe you've heard about it. It's definitely the most popular, you know, kind of concept from the Kabbalah. But there's a lot of ways that this information can be applied. And again, at the end of the day, if you ask 10 different Kabbalists, what is the Kabbalah mean to you? You're probably going to get 10 different answers because it's all about the person's personal experience with God. So at the end of the day, the whole point is that it's going to be complete. It's going to be different, you know. Because at the, the heart of it is this idea that everyone has a deep personal relationship with God. But again, you kind of have to move past that and say, okay, well, what does that deep personal relationship with God look like? And I'm here to tell you that in my life, as a practitioner of these things, it looks a lot like add enough numbers. Like, for example, three and four, it's now 340. Three and four together, add them together, what's that? Seven, victory. And that's my number for victory. And then if you multiply them together, that's, uh, well, it just became 341. So now that's uh, three and four, that's 12 times one is uh, still 12. And then two and one together is two. So there's another two back to the duality. <laughs> so in other words, I got to get back to the duality of, uh, of the life and pushing the masculine forces of life against the feminine forces to create something beautiful and that will be encompassed here in the three very soon <laughs> show it up here in my life and uh in fact i think that to commemorate this i will read from the third volume of the zohar so there's a couple of different kabbalistic texts that uh, you can look into one of them is the zohar the zohar is a collection of different writings from around the same time that the New Testament was, was written. The Zohar was also written. And uh, it's basically kind of a mystical, ap mystical reading of the Torah. So in other words, it's getting into the five first books of the Bible, the Torah, and explaining what they're actually saying. So it's basically giving almost a alternative understanding of the Old Testament. And really, again, for me at least, one of the most important things that this shows here is that this is what's possible that at the end of the day it's not necessarily saying hey don't listen to the bible listen to the zohar it's more saying hey a human can do this a human can look at this text the bible or the torah and they can come to their own conclusions they can come to their own applications and here's a gigantic volume of text on how some very enlightened folks did this basically and that is the zohar it's the kabbalah written down essentially and it's where a lot of this stuff comes from. It's where a lot of these ideas originate about what I was, you know, just breaking down for you. So I want to read to you from uh, the third, uh, the third volume of the Zohar. I have an English translation. Let me read for you who it is. It's by Rabbi Shimon Bar Yachai with the Sulem commentary by Rav Yehuda Ashlag. Because there, there's a lot of different versions of the Zohar. There's different translations because it's, it's uh, originally in Hebrew, in ancient Hebrew, basically. It's published by the Kabbalah Center International Incorporated, um, edited by Rabbi Michael Berg. So that's the version that I have. That's what I've been studying. It's, 20, it's I think, 23 volumes. All right, I'm going to open to a random page and see what is here. <laughs> random page. It's page 213. All right. He says, because David did not preserve this sign of the covenant as he should have, kingship was taken away from him and he was banished from Jerusalem. He was afraid that he would immediately be brought down to be handed over to Duma, that he would die in the world of truth uh, without meriting spiritual life. Then he was given the good news. As it is written, Hashem also has commuted your sin. You shall not die. At that very moment, he explained, unless Hashem had been my help, my soul had been dwelt in silence, meaning that he would have been handed over to the angel Duma. Another one continued the discussion by asking what is meant by the words of David, and show me both him and his habitation. For who is able to see the Holy One, blessed be he? And he replies, we have learned at the moment when Absalom decreed David's punishment David knew that it was because by sinning with Bathsheba, he did not preserve the sign as he should have. So he was punished in this, in having his kingdom taken away from him, because everything is united as one, and everything is alluded to in this sign. Malkut of above, and Jerusalem, 
and one is not a righteous man if he does not preserve the sign properly. For this reason, Dave, David prayed and said, and show me both him and his habitation. What is, uh, what is this? It is this? It is the sign of the he holy covenant. And David was afraid that he had lost it. Why did he think that he had lost the sign of the covenant? Because these two, the kingdom and Jerusalem, are both attached to this sign of the covenant. So as the kingship was taken away from him and he was banished from Jerusalem, he thought that the sign of the, the covenant was also taken away from him. Therefore, in, he, in his prayer, he linked Otto and his habitation together because Otto uh, alludes to the sign, the covenant, and his habitation to Malkut. So he prayed that Malkut, the kingdom, which is attached to this sign, may return to its place and both subjects are actually the same. The Zohar is a very interesting text, to be honest with you. It, uh, it basically, let me open to another, go to another page. I'm going to go to page 285. He said to them, uh, I said to them, my sons, the sayings of this book are close to the sayings of the Torah, but you should stay away from these books so that you will not be attracted to those beliefs and all those aspects that are mentioned there. Otherwise, heaven forbid, you may abandon the service of the Holy One. Be bless blessed be he. People are led astray because of these books. The people of the East were wise and inherited this wisdom from Abraham, who gave it to the sons of the concubines. As it is written, but to the sons of the concubines, which Abraham had, Abraham gave gifts and sent them away from his son, while he yet lived eastward to the east country. Afterward, they developed their wisdom in many directions. And, uh, yeah, so anyway, the, the Zohar, it's this, basically, it's a reading of, uh, it's almost like a recording of fic a fictional conversation between uh, this rabbi and all of his students. And all of his students are in this, again, this fictional story, are asking the rabbi questions about the Torah. And it's usually in the form of, hey, when David or, you know, when Moses said su such and such, what did he actually mean? And then the rabbi says, oh, he actually meant this. And then that's the, the meaning of the Kabbalah. That's the, uh, it, it's written in a, in a type of code, I guess is what I'm saying. It's like when you first hear it, it doesn't make a lot of sense, but then you understand it's written in this format of where they ask questions and then he gives an answer. And oftentimes the answer doesn't make a whole lot of sense, but that's not really the point. The point is that whatever he said, that's what you're actually supposed to be kind of taken away from, you know, this chapter, basically, this chapter of the Zohar. <laughs> and uh, he come to all these sorts of things. Like I've had so many wonderful times just opening this this collection of books and just uh, diving in. And every time it's a really, uh, a really powerful time. Like the more I read this book, the more I just want to spend time reading it. And uh, I think I will. I think I'll read it some more. <laughs> so I'm going to read from uh, volume one. And this is going to be page 199. I just want to give you one more taste of this stuff. The verse, let the earth bring forth grass, which is Genesis 111, is the secret of the lower union, as it is now revealing its powers in these waters that have been gathered in one place. The Moken are drawn down into it in a concealed and a hidden manner. And from within it come forth supernal and concealed souls and holy hosts. These are formed and drawn using the edifices of faith by the righteous, the men of faith, namely the female waters, by worshiping their master. This is the secret of the verse. Who causes this grass to grow for the cattle? Which is Psalms 104, 114. This is the living creature that crouches on a thousand mountains and for whom grass is grown every day. This grass refers to those angels who govern only for a specific time, but then must vanish immediately because they were created on the second day. Their dominion draws upon the left column that was created on the second day. In their dominion, they wish to annul the right. They are destined to be food for this living creature, which means that nothing of their illumination is drawn down to the lower beings. Only the female principle enjoys it, and then she burns and annuls them with it. As there is fire that consumes fire, which is the dominion of the left, called fire. In the verse, in plants for the service of man, the word plants refers to wheels, holy living creatures and cherubs. The wheels are the angels of Asiya, the holy living creatures are the angels of Yetzirah, and the cherubs are the angels of Bria. All of these are made ready and clothed by the Creator Himself. 
However, they are further prepared when people worship their master with sacrifices and prayer. This is what is meant by the service of man. The plants were predestined and prepared for the service of man and will be further perfected by that service as it should be. When they are made ready by the service of man, sustenance and food come from the earth to the world, as it is written, that he may bring forth food out of the earth. This is what is meant, herb yielding seed, which is the secret of the mokin. The grass and hay does not yield any seed, but is intended to be consumed by the sacred fire of the female principle, as explained above, whereas the herb, which yields seed, is intended for the improvement of the world. All of this is to bring forth food out of the earth, because all the improvements given to people are only for the purpose of establishing this herb out of the earth, which is the female principle. Thus, people's service to their master is designed to supply sustenance and food from out of this earth to this world, so that people will be blessed from above. So, again, you can take from it what you will, and uh, I really do recommend that you study this topic and kind of form this personal relationship to it, because you'll find it's a deep rabbit hole uh, with a lot of reading and a lot of meditating and a lot of math. So, welcome to Exploring the Kabbalah.